what is TIR? Uh, it is an initiative. We initiated this initiative in uh, our team, in the Forest Landscape Restoration Mechanism, in partnership with uh, the CBD Secretariat, the Forest Ecosystem Restoration Initiative. Um, in 2019, we organized a first uh, expert meeting in Rome uh, with future partners, uh, C4, uh, World Resource Institute, IUCN. And today we were supposed to have on board several colleagues from WRI, but unfortunately, they were not authorized to travel due to COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, but uh, now we have a, a network of around 20 uh, contributing organization uh, working on this uh, activity of economic and ecosystem restoration. We received seed funding uh, from the CPF Joint Initiative on FLR on forest landscape restoration. The CPF is a collaborative partnership on forest. And uh, in 2020, we started to work on several work packages with uh, different leads. Uh, first, the objective was to build something on cost, to, uh, a framework to collect um, uh, cost of, eco of restoration, of forest landscape restoration. I have something on the screen that is not allowing me to see the, the slide. Then we started to work on the benefits with WRI leading and uh, C4 was in charge of the baseline context and uh, also to start to brainstorm on what kind of database we could build, build uh, for this uh, um, economic on, uh, of ecosystem restoration initiative. Next, please. Uh, what are the current activity? So after a long discussion with uh, this group of experts, uh, scientific people, so uh, they are very precise and uh, when they are preparing a framework, so it took time, but we prepare a standard framework um, that is a common grammar for the recording of costs and benefits. So we have a, a, an Excel file, an Excel sheet that is relatively um, complex, but well-defined, well-designed, well and um, uh, that is supposed to allow uh, restoration practitioner, project coordinator, to fill their data on cost um, and benefits of ecosystem restoration. Uh, we tested this template in several pilot sites, and now we are in a phase to try to collect data from as many projects or partners as possible. Uh, we have some activities ongoing in the context of the restoration initiative led by the TRI. And in some country, we will propose the framework to our national teams. We have in mind to support uh, this activity in the context of the food system, land use and restoration impact program and the GF7. And we have seed money again from this impact program to allow us to collect data from those national child project and uh, follow, and it's 27 countries with a project everywhere in the world. Um, and hopefully under the GEF-8 uh, impact program on ecosystem restoration in the context of the multi-partner trust fund um, of the UN decade, we have secured outputs on this issue to collect information on ecosystem restoration and on cost and benefits of ecosystem restoration. So we are in this phase to try to upscale our data collection process. And we are using all the opportunity uh, that we have. I'm sure that with the Green Climate Fund, we can find ways to collaborate and to see if there is Green Climate Fund project interested to collaborate with us. The idea is to build a database and uh, an interface to make the data accessible because the origin of this initiative on the economic of ecosystem restoration is the lack of data on costs and benefits. Those data are fragmented, they are not available. When they are available, they are not harmonized, they are not comparable. And this initiative was really implemented at the beginning to harmonize this data collection process to make the information uh, comparable and, and, and useful for uh, project designer and any users uh, on ecosystem uh, restoration cost and benefits data. Next, please. 
So the tier framework, what it's a kind of common grammar for recording of cost and benefits of restoration. Uh, the idea is to work at the intervention unit uh, scale. Um, <clears throat> and we developed a typology of intervention of restoration activities to allow the collection of data. Next, please. Uh, the idea is to be able to compare what is comparable, uh, to dissociate project cost from cost of the related restoration implementation, uh, which is not always the case when you are looking for data on cost and benefits in the context of projects. You have all the cost of the project, you have staff, you have a lot of things, and at the end, you don't know exactly what was really the cost of the restoration activity. Uh, and the idea also with the database is to be able to build a statistical model um, of restoration implementation cost uh, for country in different ecosystems, the level of degradation, et cetera. Next, please. So in the current period with uh, the momentum on ecosystem restoration, that is uh, a UN decade, uh, uh, several impact program under GF7 and GF8 with a strong focus on restoration. Uh, the multi partner trust fund of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration and this ambition to upscale restoration efforts uh, by 2030. Uh, we still need to demonstrate to investors that restoration is providing benefits. And we need to demonstrate to investors, both public, private, green climate fund, adaptation fund, Jeff, that the benefits are higher than the cost and that it's important and interesting to invest in, uh, in this kind of activity. Next, please. Uh, so, those information, sorry, I already said that. So the information uh, are uh, needed to really make the um, restoration cost benefits analysis possible to convince investors to, to put money on, uh, on those uh, ecosystem restoration initiatives. Next, please, I think it is finished. Thank you very much. And uh, this presentation will be completed now uh, I think by uh, Valentina. I don't know who is the speaker after. It's you first and then Valentina. So I will give you the floor, Alexandre, for the next presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Christophe. While uh, Fabio brings on screen my presentation. Uh, I'll take again these opportunities to present our sincere apologies in the difficulties to bring the technique for this hybrid event and to thank all those that helped, which is, I think to a certain extent, it shows very much uh, what the effect of a partnership can be. And this is what we're trying to do with TIER in fact. Uh, so next slide, please. So as, as you know, uh, land degradation is everywhere. Uh, just to show these very assessments are, are very, very much because they don't take into account same degrees of degradation, have different assessment methodologies. So we just took the latest one, 20 to 40% of, of the land area of the globe is degraded or degrading, and this number is getting higher every year. Uh, one estimation is that land degradation could cost between eight and uh, it's more than 10, but hidden by, by, by participants, trillion per year. And it also affects one to three billion people worldwide. Next slide, please. So the impacts of land degradation are huge, including eco environmentally, economically, and, and socially. Uh, this is why there is more and more interest in ecosystem restoration 
uh, not only from governance and public actors, but also sustainable finance could be interested in projects. And ecosystem restoration to a great extent is contributing to so many of the sustainable development goals, you know, biodiversity, uh, climate change, economic and social. However, it is markedly underfunded with a funding gap that has been estimated at $300 billion per year. Uh, next slide, please. And so th there is a big gap, in fact, between what we know it globally restoration brings all these benefits globally and on average, and the means that we have to say this individual project is going to bring this and that. And this is the scale at which you need to attract an investor for a specific project. So it's very clear from various scientific analysis on big numbers that every dollar invested in restoration brings seven to $30 of various benefits. So there is potential to attract funding from the public sector, from the private sector, from sustainable finance, and from various combinations. But all funders, what they want to know is what is the cost of the project in a reliable way with, with examples to show that it's true, the number you give. Because you don't want to overfund, but you don't want to underfund because otherwise you're not going to achieve your objective. And there is a, a bit of a risk of, of a kind of uh, not inflation, but inflation of projects undervalued in order to get the money, but that finally will not deliver. So we really want to know what is the cost first and what is the benefit in order to assess cost and benefit of an operation. And when I say we, it, it, it's mainly the individual funder for an individual project. Next slide, please. In addition, there is also the need to be able to compare projects. If I don't, for a big public investor, where do I put the money? Where is the best cost benefit ratio? And as Christophe has said, the, the problem is that cost data is seldom and inconsistently collected in the projects. It's absolutely not systematic and it's done in very different ways. A, a review in, in 2009 of, of 2000 projects showed that only 5% reported costs. Another estimation was that around 2.5% of scientific publications included information on cost, not even talking about benefit. Next slide, please. So the objectives of TR is to fill this gap, to collect comparable data in a wide range of projects, very diverse in terms of geography, and type of intervention in a standardized way on costs and on benefits, including non-marketable environmental and social benefits. So the collection needs to be very broad with enough information, reliable, but also easy to conduct. And this is where uh, Christophe was saying, we talked for hours and hours. You have to find the right degree of what you asked to a project manager, you cannot ask too much because they, they don't have the time to do that, but you need to ask enough so that it's usable and useful. So it was really to find this balance because if it's too difficult to gather the information, simply it won't be gathered. No? Uh, the template, there was a question in the chat, is the template available? Yes, it is. It is now available in five languages, Chinese, English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. It has been pilot tested. Uh, it has been improved to take into account the comments of the project manager saying, oh, this is a bit too long. Can you simplify this? It would be useful to do that. So really now it's, it's for everybody to use it, to gather that, that information in order to populate the database uh, Christophe was talking about. 
the, the, the ultimate objective is to make all this data available to users. So users can be financing institutions, it can be project managers, it can be researchers in order to make in ex ante estimations of potential costs and the benefits of a project by looking at comparable projects as close as possible. And also to make analysis and synthesis on categories of projects, for instance, the projects that initiated 10 years ago on a certain type of intervention in a certain ecosystem, what have they brought in terms of benefits? Comparing costs between regions, between types of intervention, these kinds of analysis. Next slide, please. So I, I'm not going to enter into the detail that are written very small. Uh, the, so the first thing is that the collection is done at project level. So for one project, we collect all the information and including how it was collected by whom extra in order to guarantee the quality of the information. Next slide, please. Then as Christophe has said, that's very important. It's a central concept in the whole project. The unit of collection is what we call a unit, intervention unit, which is globally a space on which you have done the same type of intervention and all the conditions are similar because otherwise it needs to be homogeneous in terms of intervention Otherwise, you cannot compare costs. No? Uh, next. Uh, so for each of these units, we look at the type of intervention, the state of degradation it is, uh, the state of restoration we project, and what are the combination of actions on that specific piece of land. Next slide, please. And then for each of these units, we, we asked the manager to compile all the costs, the seeds, uh, the labor, uh, the income foregone when it's an exclosure, all these kinds of costs. And when it is cost for the whole project, they are cut down so that they come back also to the intervention unit. Next slide, please. So this has been done in very detailed way for the costs using available methodologies, of course, so that then we do the same for the marketable benefits. So this was uh, the module where that was developed by WRI. And there are globally two types of benefits, the one that are marketable for which it's easy to, con to, know, to have a market value um, and to record them because generally they are recorded at farm level and, and you can ask the farmer, okay, last year you, you had that yield, uh, in ten, oh, this year you had this yield and things like that. So what the template is recording is timber, wood fuel, non-timber forest products, perennial crops, annual crops, animal products and, and meat, fisheries, tourism revenue, and, and other with the possibility to indicate. There are some examples where some ecosystem benefits do have a market value when they are entered in, in a specific contract with a water company, for instance. So, and for each category towards the baseline benefits at, before the beginning of the project, and the way it changes along the life in the project and further. And, and then we, we use, we, we give the opportunity to the responder to, to indicate changes that are expected because not everything will have been realized at the moment when you ask the questions. And there could be also totally different benefits Categories that were not in the baseline but that appear because of the project. For instance, when you change the use of the land from crops to forestry, there was no timber, now there is timber. Next slide, please. And then.
Alex, I cannot hear you any longer. Unmute, okay. Uh, so then you have non-marketable benefits. Uh, a big part of that is environmental benefits. Carbon, for instance, adaptation to climate change, water quality, uh, regularity of water fluxes, biodiversity conservation. But you also have plenty of social benefits. For instance, when your degraded land is the land that is supporting an indigenous population that has no other issue than to migrate because it cannot anymore survive on the land, the fact that you restore the land belonging to this indigenous population enables this indigenous people to preserve its way of life and its livelihood. There are also examples where the restoration project focusing on certain type of products does have an impact on gender balance in, in households. For a typical case is karité, for instance, in, in West Africa, which is a product that very much benefits women and women associations that transform and, and, and sell it. Uh, we also, what is very important here is to consider not only short-term benefits, but also long-term over 35 years, including after the end of the project, because you know the restoration project might be five years, but the real effect of the restoration project and its benefits will go on increasing 10 years, 15, 20 years after the end of the project. Or on the other side, it could be the good practices may be abandoned and then you will stop having the increase of benefits. So it's important to monitor what's happening after the end of the project. And um, so, one of the big difficulties, as I said, is that these benefits for they are non-marketable and many of them are in the future. So what the project does is to collect basic information now, which is easily to access and use it to model future benefits as best as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, so, one of the issues is that collecting this data is a lot of effort for the manager. So to give them an incentive to do it, the, the tier team has created this dashboard of, that is a tool for the project manager to follow his own project or to valorize it with various uh, stakeholders and partners. So, he puts information in the system and he gets out of the system an analysis of his own project, which is already a, a, a form of, of valorization for him. Next slide, please. And, and one of the very easy results is cost benefits, for instance, by intervention unit, depending on types of intervention. So the first step was, was to prepare these templates. Second one was to pilot it, that has been done. Uh, then the, the next intervention will show you the results of, of the first collection of data. And now really the ambition is to collect as much as possible in as much different situations, which is why I was so happy to see the question, where is it accessible? Yes, it is accessible and you'll have the mail where to get it at the end of my presentation, because the more people ask about it, the more data will collect. And, and uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, next slide, that's the timeline, what I was just saying. So, and this is where you can find more information. So for more information, first, there is a, a paper for the World Forestry Congress that is accessible on the website of the Congress. And then just send the mail to the tier team, tier, uh, at fao.org to get the template and, and support to collect data and how 
how you can be supported technically to do so, because really the ambition is, is to get as much as possible information to make the data as useful as possible. Uh, over and over to you, uh, Fabio, for uh, the next presentation. Thank you. In my presentation, I take T-E-E-R, and I start with the E-R, and then I finish with the T-E. Uh, next slide, please, Fabio. I'll, I'll just speak very quickly about the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, for those who are less familiar with the organization. We are the world's largest dedicated climate fund with uh, uh, a $10 billion portfolio. We were set up by the UNFCCC and we serve the Paris Agreement. Uh, and what that means in practice is that we support countries in uh, uh, mitigation and ad adapting to climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, and we have eight, that's how it's supposed to be our focus. We have eight uh, result areas. And you can see uh, top right here that we have forest and land use as one of our mitigation result areas. Uh, but of course, um, forests cut across a number of these result areas. So we do receive forest related projects which don't fall on the forest and land use and instead fall on the uh, ecosystems and ecosystem services. Fabio, I'm going to ask you to press five times so that it'll circle the five different result areas um, uh, that forests are related to. One, keep going. Yes, okay. Uh, livelihoods of people and communities, health, food and water security, and uh, all the way to energy genera generation and access for fuel wood related projects. Next slide, please, Fabio. And within forest and land use, we have three paradigm shifting pathways, uh, protection, restoration, and sustainable management. So you can see that restoration is one of the critical areas that we want to focus on in terms of forest and land use. And of course, that is not specific to forest and land use. It also has an important impact on livelihoods, on food and water, on, yes, food, food and water security, um, on fuel wood, and of course, ecosystems and ecosystem services. Next slide, please. A very quick slide just to highlight uh, uh, the emphasis that we're, we would like to give ecosystem restoration. And this is a project which is currently in our pipeline, so it hasn't been approved yet. Um, but FAO brought this uh, very, um, uh, very ambitious uh, proposal to, to us recently. Uh, it's known as Suragua, which actually means scaling up resilience for the African uh, Great Green Wall. And as you can see, it's ambitious in many dimensions. There are eight countries. We have four result areas, four of the eight that I uh, presented a couple of slides ago. Um, the mitigation and adaptation objectives are extremely ambitious, in addition to which this proposal aims to restore 2 million hectares across these eight countries. And interestingly, and I'm going to come back to this idea, um, this proposal uh, includes the establishment of a revolving fund for bio businesses. Next slide, please. Now, I was talking about the ER, ecosystem restoration. Let's talk about the TE, the economics, right? Uh, GCF is very interested in uh, the economics of ecosystem restoration. Uh, and so uh, I've been following the, the, uh, the presentations with great interest. What we would like to see is even go one step further and uh, uh, see how the economics of ecosystem restoration could help make the business case for investments in ecosystem restoration. And that includes, includes uh, creating a track record, a commercial track record. Why is this important? Well, we have ecosystem restoration on one hand, and we have the finance sector on the other. And the aim is to really bring the two together so that next, if you press once again, Fabio, uh, so that you can see that when these two overlap, that's the sweet spot. That is the area where ecosystem restoration can crowd in private finance in particular. I was talking earlier today about the huge financing that gap there is for forests and the fact that public financing won't plug that gap alone. And we can only close that gap by mobilizing private finance at scale. Hence the importance of being able to speak to the finance sector, to large financial institutions, um, so that we can unlock that private finance at scale. 
they will only be interested if they know that there's a commercial track record. The finance specialists uh, look at data, right? And they don't necessarily only look at cost and benefit. They look at uh, the returns on investment and especially the track record in this respect. But it's important to be able to provide the data that financial specialists are looking for, the free or discounted cash flows, the weighted average cost, cost per capital, and uh, above all the risks. If they're unable to quantify, if they're not unable to put a price on the risks, they're not going to invest. They have to take into account these risks and factor them in, into their own equations so that they can see if it's worth investing or not, right? And so what ideally what we would like to be able to see in, in this initiative is the economic data being pulled out and providing the background for establishing these uh, the commercial track record for quantifying the risks so that we can make the business case. And if the, bus the, the business case is not there, next slide, please, Fabio. If the business case is not there, the GCF is there to help tilt the balance in favor of, uh, of making this business case. And so we can help de-risk ecosystem restoration initiatives. We've got a range of financial instruments at hand, so not only grants, but also loans, equity, and guarantees. And these are specifically designed to de-risk private investment, to actually tilt the balance in favor and say, okay, this is, you know, if, if the private sector invests in here, if financial institutions invest in this, in this initiative, they're going to get their, their return on investment as per the commercial track record, okay? And that can be key in tilting away from land conversion towards ecosystem restoration. Next slide, please. Just a couple of examples of how we can crowd in private finance. Um, and I saw that there was a number of marketable benefits. Uh, and these marketable benefits are deal sweeteners. This is what can attract private finance, okay? One additional area that could crowd in private finance is carbon markets. We can see here on the left, this is a, a um, uh, uh, a chart that was taken from the State of Voluntary Carbon Markets by Forest Trends released last year. And what we see is, a, is the, the, the fact that forestry and land use here on the left-hand side is very specific. Not only red plus carbon credits have exploded in the past year, a 280% growth, but also that forest-related carbon credits tend to fetch much higher prices. And the only other sector that where, where carbon credits fetch prices these high, and these are it's difficult to see here, but those little gray, um, gray dots here are the carbon prices. And you can see in forestry and land use, they're higher than in, in energy. The only other exception is in agriculture here on the other side, where you can see that the carbon credit prices can fetch very high prices, very high levels as well. Um, press once again, Fabio, please. Why do they, they, they fetch high prices? It's because the buyers in voluntary carbon markets are not only interested in the ton of carbon, but they're also interested in what we call the co-benefits. These co-benefits are social benefits, they're environmental benefits, biodiversity, livelihoods, etc. And this is a real strength of ecosystem restoration. It delivers not only carbon, but it delivers a wide range of benefits. And so carbon credits that are derived from ecosystem restoration have that potential uh, to, to unlock private financing through the these voluntary carbon markets at a pretty interesting price. Next slide, please. The other opportunity which I wanted to highlight is blue carbon. We've been hearing a lot about blue carbon in recent months, and maybe in the past two, three years. We've been working a lot with blue carbon without calling it blue carbon, okay? Mangroves are blue carbon, right? Um, tidal marshes, seagrasses are blue carbon. But what's interesting about blue carbon is that there, there's a huge uh, potential for carbon sequestration and for carbon storage, considerably higher than tropical forests, which are already pretty promising in terms of carbon storage and sequestration. But in addition to which, uh, there's a range of co-benefits in terms of food security, in terms of uh, adaptation, enhancing resilience of coast, coastal ecosystems to sea level rise. Um, 
uh, and in terms of uh, in terms of livelihoods. So again, we've got this range of co-benefits, and if we can capitalize on this blue carbon and through ecosystem restoration of these coastal environments, generate high quality carbon credits that come with this range of co-benefits, again, it can fetch very high prices in the voluntary carbon market. So these are just a couple of examples of how we could unlock private finance. Now, if TIA can go that extra step and, and make that business case, then we would be happy to finance some, some initiatives that would be focusing on it or that would be related to TIA. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, and if you're still here, thank you all for going through all the, 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 the technical issues. You know, it's the first one of we do this in this Korea. So thank you all for still stacking with us. So we just heard Benjamin, you know, really talking about the, all the different projects and how important this is, the, the Terra, the economics of ecosystem restoration. What I want to do, talk a little bit about how we're going to use this project because we have been part of this whole development and why are we part of it? Because I think it's so important without understanding the benefits and costs, it's not only for our scientific understanding or for the investor, it's also for the local people actually implementing this. They want to understand better as an accounting tool and especially as like, can they reproduce it? Because you have to think about all these projects that are going on, like it's the tip of the iceberg. We need to have many of those projects to actually come to what we want to have, like millions of hectares on restoration and almost a billion ton of carbon sequestered. Now, as we know, forest is this, this weird system that uh, is a lot of sucking up carbon, but can also be emitting. And so if you just leave forest alone, you know, it sucks up all those carbon. And that has been, you know, of course, a great value. That's something we still need to do. We need to protect those forests for deforestation. As you know, you, we, we just came out uh, last Thursday with the new global forest watch numbers. And, you know, forest is still disappearing at a way too alarming rates. But so, we're not talking here also about the, the reforestation. That is really where we think about what is the restoration. And that is, I think, where with this TER, the economics of restoration is so important. I think we've seen all this, you know, uh, this article, this paper, it's a little bit older now, 2017, how important natural-based solutions are in, in, you know, in the climate change issues. You know, I know this is a huge range from to, to almost 20, you know, petagram. But if you think about that, the, the global GHG emissions is this number, you can see how much forest restoration and nature can contribute to climate change. And, and you know, the IPCC report that came out and said like, without nature, we, we cannot get where we will need to be to have our temperature in check um, globally. And if you just, you know, I'm looking outside here um, in Washington, you see on, on the, my yards and the trees here, you know, you can also understand the simple tree, just a piece of wood, you know, you know, a tree can sequester almost 20 kilograms of carbon in a year, you know, and in a tropical and wet tropical circumstance can even be more. So trees clearly part of the solution. Um, but of course, it depends very much where you grow. It. So, you know, you see two very different circumstances. You know, one in Niger, one in, in Indonesia, a wet and a dry surface, and and um, also how and what you do. This is you know restoration. It's reforestation here in Flores, Indonesia. But what we are focused on, and where the TER is really focused on, there's a lot of trees in the agricultural landscapes, in the rural agricultural landscapes. You know. Trees are just part of the landscape, part of the agriculture system. This is a place in Rwanda where you see that there's everywhere trees, but there's everywhere crops. And, you know, there has been these this studies coming out more and more, and it is also a little bit older now, this study, um, also to, together with the FAO, um, on how many trees there are in the landscape, you know, uh, and half a billion hectares have never been counted, you know, uh, before, because it are those trees, which are not really a forest, but they still are very important. And in some countries, actually trees outside the forest have more biomass than the forest. And that is because there are so much area under agriculture and has these trees mixed in it that they have a more biomass and sometimes even have a lot of contribution to biodiversity. To give some examples on, on how that exists and, and where we think this 
this project on restoration are so important. You see a Kenyan landscape, you know, all kind of trees and farms, it's all integrated. Um, you know, in Ethiopia, grazing park landscape, this more classical agroforestry, you know, where there are crops and trees grown together. And here you see a very nice issue on, on how those trees are distributed and, and settlements. And I think that's also something we see. We, we put a lot of efforts uh, as WRI to measure those restoration progress. It's not as easy as deforestation, but we are getting there. But what you see is that close to settlements, there are more trees because trees are valued, you know, because they give shade or they give, you know, uh, mangoes, whatever they do, but they are really valued. So you have this like, more people and more trees and that is that is an important thing that trees are part of this landscape and you see another so but what i want to come so you see what i said at the beginning like what environmental factors are we have to understand and there are many as you see and you don't have to read all these but as you can imagine the rainfall temperature etc are all important parts to understand what it is and that's to say that tree planting is not simple like you know to tree where to plant a tree, but also how to protect it. If you just leave plants in, you know, as this gentleman plants here and you leave it alone, a cow might grow by and just, you know, eat that nice juicy sapling. And so we have to think about which tree needs to grow where. And, you know, again, the IPC report came up like, we can just not, you know, willy nilly plant trees because there's competition on land use. We have to think about, you know, we only have so much land to, to start up with and we need to have food because we need to produce foods. We need to all eat, but we also need to have more trees. And so we have to really think about where is it or can our system produce both? And it also was, and that is very central in our thinking, it has to be adapted to the local circumstances. You know, uh, we have known from previous 10, 20, 30 years ago, big plantations that had no benefits for local people. And so why would people you know, use this and, and work with this? So that's how we started to work on, the, on this Terra Fund for Africa, funding like finding financiers to fund 100 projects. And that HANA project didn't say we're going to go from this part. We said, we understand this is important, but if we have seen all those agroforestry system and other systems that we see in the tropics, why not use the innovation of those local people? Because we know that African leaders have understood there is a problem with degradation. They have pledged you now hundreds of millions, hundred million hectares to restore. And most land belongs to community as part of the community. So, what we were trying to do is like, can have all those innovation spirit, all those people are doing already, can they incentivize to do more of it? And so not looking in that sense to say like top down approach to where can we have it, but like, where do people want to do? Where are people, local people working on it? And so we got those funders together, funded 100 projects, um, you know, around hopefully 20 million hectares with so many partners working on this like 100 projects in Africa. And now these people, so what we do, we do the monitoring of because these people need to do what they're good at. They are entrepreneurs, they are communities, they plant trees, they grow trees. And that is the important part where we can take over some of the monitoring and carbon assessments. But what is important here, and, and that is really in the core of our thinking, and that's the core of the TER where we are being, we need to understand the system, what goes in, what goes out for understanding can be replicated or should be replicated or should we change it and then to scale it. I mean, 100 projects are only 100 projects. I said we need thousands, we need 10,000 of projects, but we can only do it by understanding, counting it, how much has been gone in, how much got done, how much benefits are there for the local people. And therefore, the TER, the thinking is central, I think, central in, a, in, in the whole issue on climate change is like we need to understand the count it. I cannot understand much if we only can manage it when you can measure it. I mean, if we can find out that it's workable, maybe the neighbor is gonna say, hey, this is great, we can do this too. Or we find out actually there's more going in and you know we just heard it from the Green Climate Fund. Maybe they can use a different way of funding it. Or maybe we can change something in the systems. So only by understanding that financial in and out and the benefits, we can adapt systems, it can be replicated. And the replication is so important. It's 
of course, it's important to project importance if it works out. But what is really important if this project is works out and is replicated by their neighbors and the neighbors and the other people. And I think that's what it's really this TER. It's so not a scientific tool, of course it is, but it is a really tool that if we do this right and if we get a lot of input, it can be so important for scalability. So that's why we are so invested and we're so happy to work with our partners with C4 and FAO and others have developed this and we see that really as a real core. With that, I'll give it back to Fabio. Thank you, Fred. Excellent presentation as all the other ones. So um, now the floor goes back to um, Korea and uh, we can either uh, have um, the discussion on the questions or on the Slido or we can run uh, Valentina's presentation. If you saw the issue with Valentina, I suggest that you, you, run, you run it. Yeah. And then okay. we'll have a quick session of interaction around. Okay, yes. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Valentina Garavaglia. I'm an international consultant working for FAO for the Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism, supporting the Economics of Ecosystem Restoration Initiative. You have seen in the previous presentation what is there, uh, why it is important, and how it is placed in the international scene, like uh, in the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. What I will show you now is uh, the first results that has been uh, collected uh, through uh, the piloting phase. This piloting phase was implemented to test the framework for data collection that has been developed by many experts to ensure that it's consistent and easy to use for the, for the project manager or the respondent. I will show you the results of the review of projects available for data collection. Uh, this review uh, allows us to identify three types of data that could be collected through the framework for data collection. Type one is uh, data collected throughout the life of projects. Type two is uh, data uh, or projections based on initial project plans and documents. Type three are data retrofitted from projects close to the end or already closed. This uh, slide shows you uh, the review of uh, available project for type one and uh, two uh, data. We identified 90 projects implemented by 61 organizations in 51 countries, plus three global and regional uh, projects. We could send out the different uh, templates like uh, 42 initially, and we receive uh, some information and feedback from the project managers. Um, we receive feedbacks, especially on the first tab of the framework of data collection that you have seen allows uh, uh, the collection of information like the topic of the project, the duration, uh, the total funds, uh, the source of fundings and so on. We could also go uh, more in detail and uh, collect information, quant quantitative information or intervention units that are the minimum basis of the framework for data collection, the foundation, I would say, of the tier, and which is uh, not easy uh, to identify for the project manager. In this phase, we uh, usually support the project manager with uh, online calls and meetings uh, to correctly identify these intervention units. Here you can see more details on the project that have been reviewed. They are uh, mostly implemented by UN agencies and uh, we focused, of course, on forest ecosystem and forest uh, landscapes. Uh, we identify mostly uh, projects uh, in uh, Latin America and uh, Africa, but we are trying also to identify uh, projects uh, and case studies in the Asia uh, Pacific regions um, in collaboration with uh, IUCN, for example. The general tab of the template for data collection provides also information on the duration of the project, which is important to identify if we are analyzing uh, uh, data types uh, one, two or three. 
uh, we identify projects uh, six year long uh, but in average uh, they were between three and five uh, uh, years long and is this information it's key also to understand the length of the activities that are implemented on the ground the exercise of uh, putting together all these projects for data collection and analyze the kind of information that the project documents provide plus the effort from project managers that replied to our template for uh, data collection uh, allowed the, the preparation of these two small tables. These tables present uh, some quantitative information on the area under reservation in the project documents that we identified and uh, that correspond to 70 projects plus the seven uh, general tab that were provided filled in by the project managers. We did the same exercise for the total cost of projects and uh, you can see in the second table the cost per hectare from the projects, uh, the 75 projects uh, that uh, provided this information and the seven project managers that replied to uh, our, uh, I would say, call for uh, data collection. Of course, uh, this information is not exhaustive, it's uh, partial and uh, can be refined with the further effort for data collection in the next months and uh, future. And it's here that we need the support uh, and collaboration of project managers and donors and researchers and organizations to put together the information that we know that is available. We did the same as exercise with uh, projects uh, uh, with uh, type 3 data, so projects already closed or close to uh, the end. And uh, again, here we have uh, a quite wide range of uh, total cost and area under restoration. Of course, uh, again, here going into detail, we can refine this information and, and can uh, better explain uh, the variability uh, with a more consistent and homogeneous uh, information uh, collected. These few slides were intended to show you that information on cost and benefits of restoration are sometimes already available in project documents, but need to be collected in a standardized way, organized and, uh, and analyzed. Um, this first phase of the tier with the implementation of the framework for data collection and the piloted phase uh, suggested that there is a high number of projects that could be involved uh, in, the, in the tier initiative. And uh, we are currently already implementing the data collection effort, but we would like to upscale it in the next months and years. We are, for example, currently collecting information in Africa and uh, in projects that are being identified in Asia Pacific by, for example, IUC. We have a great collaboration with the partners that are already involved in the, in the initiative, but uh, the uh, subject of the tier, the cost and benefits of restoration, considering also the global movement uh, that has been uh, put together by the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, is um, causing a growing interest in this topic. We have received the interest of many technical institutions, research institutions and donors, uh, and uh, any collaboration with uh, project managers uh, and organizations at global level, it's uh, very welcome. We uh, provide uh, our total support, complete support uh, to project managers in the um, completion of the template for data collection. We know that is a, uh, an effort that we are required to the project manager and that's why uh, we also developed this, this dashboard that allows the project manager to visualize the data that they are entering in the template. So it's a way for them also to uh, take a look and monitor uh, the costs uh, that the project uh, is uh, implementing and the benefits that they are generating. Uh, what's next uh, in the, with the tier in the next uh, months and year will depend on the amount, the quantity and the quality of the data that we are collecting. Any collaboration uh, is uh, very welcome and uh, uh, I will stop here thanking you for your attention and uh, in case you will need more information on the tier do not hesitate to contact us at the email address tier at fau.org or visit the web page dedicated by to the initiative in the F FLRM webpage. I'm sure that my colleagues in the room would be happy to reply to your uh, comments and questions, but do not hesitate again to contact us. Thank you so much. Bye. Now give the floor to Vincent Gitz to facilitate a short interactive session to better 
understand uh, what are your expectations about TIER, what can be your contribution to TIER, uh, and, and how the TIER team can meet these expectations in terms of construction of the database and what can be the exploitation of the data that are the most useful to users in order also to stimulate provision of data because it's a one-way thing. The more information you give to the system, the more accurate the information the system will give you back. And as has been said, there are real, uh, there is a considerable potential for such data if it is of good quality enough to, to support potential investment because this is also something that we heard very much in the GLF Luxembourg, that the investors want economic track records and they don't have it in the sector and they don't know enough the sector. So that, yeah. So everybody, I understand we're going. Okay. So Vincent, uh, to join Slido, the instructions are on the screen. This is also for our friends okay. joining online. Uh, you can go either with your mobile phone or with your computer. You uh, go to slido.com and you enter the code WFC, as in World Force to Congress, T-E-E-R. And this will bring you to this room where you can answer the questions. Um, we'll go one by one. Over to you, Vincent. Yes, uh, thank you, Fabio, and good evening, uh, everybody. So my name is Vincent Gitz. I work in uh, C4. I'm the director of programs and platforms, um, and uh, very glad to have worked with uh, the team from FAO, WRI, and, and and many others trying to develop this uh, database uh, from now a, a few years. Um, so uh, we'll probably start uh, with the slideos and then ask the questions to the room and then also to the audience. So uh, Fabio, uh, over to you for the first. Well, yes. we can see, everybody can see the questions. In fact, it's about what type of organization do you represent? So just to have a broad feeling on, on who is here tonight. Trying to do it at the same time on my phone, <laughs> just to yes. see if it works. Yes, also the panelists should do this. It seems to work. Okay. So it's not necessarily divided from who is online and who is in the room. So we have no. sort of a joint panel here. Yes. Okay. So. Yes. Um, Mostly, mostly uh, uh, governments, academia, uh, and, uh, and 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 others, and and interestingly, uh, some some private sector. Um, that's that's quite interesting. So, okay, next, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. I guess we left. Who? What region are you from? I guess that's either based or working in at the moment uh, let's see if it's probably going to be a bit biased because oh latin america is showing up okay some some people are either here from latin america or listening from there africa asia and europe okay well i guess we'll we'll see uh, this has no mean to this is no by no means uh, a discussion that aims to be representative but it gives us an idea that we are here in a in a specifically also in an asian uh, context in this world forestry congress a next next question i think it's quite easy could you or your organization be interested in joining the initiative then maybe we can ask some question in what does that mean joining the initiative because I guess that's the question. What, what is there to, to gain? Okay, everybody's interested, maybe some not so much, but okay. Uh, still some to convince. 
Next, next slide. And how could you and your organization contribute to the initiative as a partner for data collection or as a user? Or oh, there is one or the other, so maybe it's just the main one that you may want to pick. 50-50 is not allowed. I guess that's one of the idea of this platform is that it is both uh, for the user some, uh, some incentive to put uh, their data in as they may gain some benchmarking or other forms. Of course, then there are other categories as users as funders or private sector actors that will not necessarily enter data, but would rather use, use them unless they want also to trigger the, the different projects to in fact input data into the database. Okay, so that gives us, I think it's the last, was that the last question, Fabio? No? Oh, there okay. is the last one. There is the last one, a bit more into details. What kind of uh, the product, or maybe there is a, uh, yeah. what kind of products would you be most interested in? Uh, so you've seen the different presentations, um, different kind of averages or analysis that we could draw um, from that. Geographies, types of interventions, comparative analysis to facilitate prioritization of interventions and possibility for comparative analysis tailored to the needs to assess a specific project using the database, which is kind of refined. I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's quite interesting because it shows that maybe there is a little bit of, 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 of a layer to construct uh, to extract um sensible uh, data out of out of the database for users tailored to the specific needs okay next and maybe there is the last one just yes. to play with our with one more time with our smartphones or um in your opinion what's the most important for the success of tr is it the breadth of data collection the quality and precision, the easiness, the accessibility, or uh, the protection of data because of confidentiality and property rights issues. Some of these um, bullets may be contradictory or seemingly conflicting to another, but that's the charm. I don't see, I don't see the full answers. What's the first one, the blue one? Quality and precision, okay, that was one of the key uh, mean and objective of, of this initiative. Okay, so I guess that just sets the stage for some of, of the demand and we were, uh, of, of, of what could be the expectations to the product and we were very glad to tonight to have Benjamin Singer from uh, really the, the, the Green Climate Fund uh, also to show with uh, very much details what are some of the key gaps from uh, funders and international organization, but this can be, uh, I guess, also faced by other types of actors, even private actors or philanthropies, when they just said, okay, what's the best value or, or, or the, the most uh, effective investment for the money I put in into, into restoration. So just to kick off, uh, so I guess first the question is, does anybody have someone to, say about that, uh, about the questions about also suggestions about the expectations. Does that reflect uh, and us as uh, engineers of the tool, <laughs> together with our colleagues from FAO, uh, uh, WRI, ICN, etc., on how we can uh, improve that tool? Um, is that, does that say, say anything to you? Someone wants to pick the floor? Christoph. Uh, maybe you need to come down here. Uh, ah, there was the microphone of the room over there. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm too, too late. I am here. No, just to say that one is initially one of the objectives for the, the tier framework was to become a kind of reference, as exact is a reference for carbon estimates in, in, in some project. We are not yet at this stage. We are in the phase of trying to promote data collection to partners with GF impact programs. Why not with the GCF? But I think we need, we need to maybe, maybe be a bit more proactive 
with uh, big donor organizations such as GCF, GF, etc., in the context of the impact program to see, okay, we have a tool. We know that the GF states that already to us. Uh, we have a framework with indicators that is for GF. And we cannot oblige our national partners and the national project to use something else in addition. But how, and, and I had this answer with a discussion with Ulrich Kappel. I assume that with the GCF, you have also your framework for, for indicators and, and you, 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 that are mandatory based on your board and what the donors have decided, etc. But how we can use the framework, the tier framework, to add something that is maybe not mandatory in the, in the GCF project or in uh, all the GF project, but that is becoming something that is proposed as an option. We, we should maybe think about this to allow us to multiply the number of partners, projects that are collecting the data with this framework. Just an idea. No, but thank you, Christophe. And, and this is uh, an example of a, of a tool-oriented partnership where several actors have identified a gap in, in currently in, in first what their research or sometimes very concrete needs just to, to, to prepare benchmarking for projects or just to select where, where the, the best next projects could, could, could rely. So there was this global ambition. This is why immediately we teamed up with with FAO because FAO is the international organization that has the legitimacy to host uh, such a global uh, platform and, and make it uh, some form of a collaborated and, and public good. Uh, how to give proper incentives so that uh, it kind of picks up beyond the trial, which is there is still a, there is already a considerable number of, 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 of data into that, but the ambition is to go perhaps 10,000, hundreds and thousands fold in terms of numbers of projects uh, for what we uh, ambition in the new forestry and agroforestry partnership that we're going to launch in fact tomorrow evening uh, here in, in Seoul. We are going to, I wouldn't say not necessarily force, but strongly encourage because uh, the, the different project implementers, especially for the new projects, to use that when it deals about restoration and it has a strong, I mean, each project dealing on about restoration should have in fact, some information about costs uh, and, and should have also <laughs> fully information about benefits. So one of the things and picking up, so incentives is key, are key and, and this links to being clear about what is the benefit from the, 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 the user, the input of the data. I think Alexandre Maybeck has said in the very beginning that we, there were some fine tuning, very important fine tuning in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the, the management cost or, or the transaction cost that, uh, that, that is bearing on the project implementer to, to deal with this tool in addition to all the other requirements to make that as low as possible and certainly lower than the, the benefit that, that it brings uh, to, to using the tool. Um, so that's that's clearly a challenge for 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 us to make to make sure uh, we we address that. Um, but then to trigger further discussion, perhaps uh, and, and picking up on one important issue that was mentioned by Benjamin is this issue of of uh, of well, there were two issues in fact. First, the issue of risks. I think uh, we we talked about costs and benefits. So the issue is, have we captured enough the risk and the risk of what is it the risk of of, of the marketable benefit being uh, too, uh, too un uncertain or, 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 and then have we in the tool capture that or are we in sort of a, in a no risk environment? So that's one, one question and how to deal with that. And then the issue of co-benefits. I think uh, uh, you mentioned this higher <laughs> price of carbon for in, in, in agricultural projects because of the, the existence of co-benefits. A question perhaps to you and, and the audience is, uh, isn't that in fact an, uh, something to, to, to use as an argument for using the tool? Because the tool is intervention-based and activity-based and considers the consequences of an activity as a whole, not just carbon. So basically something that is perhaps more akin to go just beyond this uh, carbon pricing. Um, yeah, so just uh, maybe just two questions to kick off the discussion. I'm not sure how long 
we still have if anybody wants to take the floor but these are two messages I, I sort of say maybe we have not captured that enough or it is a clear uh, demand from some of the actors that could reuse the tool um, yes or oh, i don't know if it's you come here or if the, the mic is working Thank you very much. My name is Jan Sope Ann from FAO Cambodia. I actually quite, I think, first of all, thank you very much for presenting this tool. It's, I think it's, it can be a very useful tool being uh, experiencing the project implementing in the field. Actually, before I came here, I met with one of the government partners. He asked FAO to help with this. Uh, the economic analysis or cost uh, and benefit analysis for plantations. And to do that, that actually we think first on the, uh, as a, an ad hoc analysis, we get uh, several experts coming in and then also to run through, to have a, a rapid kind of an assessment and doing this kind of analysis to inform the decisions maker. But, uh, and also at the implementation level, I, I mean, being engaging with the different project, actually, we uh, we are quite struggling in um, doing the cost analysis and uh, project the benefits in the next 10, 15 years. And also recently we are supporting this uh, long-term strategy for carbon neut neutrality for the royal government of Cambodia. Partly we support only on this um, FULU. And uh, we, of course we do, we ran through a very quick analysis. We estimate the um, uh, uh, into uh, we we estimate the removal of the um, uh, emissions from full sector. But <laughs> we don't do. We have another team to do this. Um, what we call the economic analysis. At the moment, we are trying also to look into the breakdown of different actions, mitigation action, agroforestry, plantation, forest management, and uh, breaking down uh, all of these actions and ident to what we call to do the, to quantify the investment need is also another challenge because it is something that we need also to. Uh, we need a tool in order to have the government to uh, uh, to identify what would be the cost if the target like 1.6 million hectare for um, uh, up to, to to reach this uh, uh, removal up to uh, 2050. So I think it's it's very, it's a really um, useful tools that can be used in the um, uh, in different level, but uh, I also understand that this tool is used at the project level, project scale, I guess, and uh, based on the sample collected, we uh, you have like uh, type one, two, and three. My question is, uh, can we get some kind of analysis at the uh, country level to some extent? We using this tool or on. Um, adapt this tool a little bit to a different context or different uh, objective of the analysis. If, for example, we would like to look into plantations uh, in a, a, a national scale, is it adaptable to get, to get this analysis or it is not the purpose of this tool yet? And um, I don't know if we can track one uh, project from the beginning until the end like as a baseline, midterm review, and final to, to compare uh, this, uh, uh, the implementation, the, uh, the lifespan of the project, the progress made, contri uh, the contributions that uh, made and compare the, the result with the actual like, uh, prop, uh, like terminal re uh, evaluation and things like that. This probably can be paired together in mm -hmm. order to get a more accurate analysis. So um, I actually have two, two questions in addition to my comment. Thank you very much. No, but that, that's, a, that's very good comments. And, and these are two important questions. I think the ambition is, I think Alexandre Lembeck has, has really mentioned in his um, first presentation that 
um, there is a big gap in terms of, 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 of some big averages being available and then what comes up from the bottom up. Uh, I think the, the immediate objective is not to have, you know, average numbers by country, but rather to have uh, very solid uh, typologies of context and typologies of interventions that we can cross check and then even look at within countries or across countries or across similar contexts. I guess if the database is rich enough, then it, it may be used, but I don't know what my colleagues feel. It may also be used for that, but I don't think that was the primary objective of, of TI. It was more to work at a, a, a lower level than the national averages. Uh, also because the countries are different and whether you are in Rwanda that has uh, under, I think, uh, under the Bond Challenge, a 98% objective of, restore, <laughs> of restoration and another country that is perhaps a bit more diverse, what does that mean an, an average cost? I mean, the average cost is more what is the average intervention in the, the, aver in the given context of, in, of degradation and, and, and so on. Yeah. That's the, the other may uh, have a different perspective. <laughs> yeah. It will have to go in two stages because what we are collecting is maybe you need to talk in the not only at project level but under project level on, on the type of it. For instance, you, you have to be like some deep dry. Apologies, you, you know, it was the enthusiasm of being again in a real, in a physical meeting at Roth. So the, the, um, it's, we have to do it in two steps to arrive to national uh, numbers. For instance, you, first we gather data on a type of intervention to restore dry lands by exclosure, for instance. And we have another one on uh, uh, restoring wetlands and, and in, in countries that have comparable situation than Laos, both economic, social, and ecosystemic. And then you can do it the other way around. You know the number of hectares that need to be restored from level A to level B with such type of intervention, you take your average number in comparable situations from the database and you use it to make an estimation and you do it for each type of intervention and so you have the cost of the intervention a uh, potential cost and benefit of intervention in a certain region or in, or in a country not averages things constructed from numbers that have been collected bottom up because what Vincent was saying is that when you think about implementation, you can no more just use the average numbers that I've mentioned. It brings seven times uh, $1. No, it doesn't work. The investor wants to know when we have done that in this situation, it has brought this and that. And the fact is that the question of trace of uh, economic data that the financial, the normal financial investor is the same kind of record than GCF wants for carbon, or this is why Christophe was mentioning EXACT, because EXACT is doing that for carbon. Now, what we dream of is a tool that can do that for carbon, for milk, for water, for biodiversity, for uh, gender equality, equity, and stuff like that. Well, over. And this is an interesting Yes, there, there are two more, two more questions and answers. Yes, please, please. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I just, just continue putting on a Don't mask forget, anyway. yeah. Well, I, I guess, I guess the <laughs> protocol. I've, I've not, I've yes, not seen uh, anything um, in writing, but I guess it's, okay, a, it's allowed yeah. when speaking. Yes, um, I'm coming from government. I work for the government of Uganda, East Africa, and uh, my name is Kazung Bob. And, uh, it's a very interesting conversation. That's why I decided to come in here. To, to listen, uh, but I just wanted to find out something. I mean, uh, many countries have done the ROM assessment, for example, mm -hmm. the restoration opportunities assessment methodology, uh, you know, and, and so we have opportunities for restoration in the country, Uganda is one case. We work with IUCN and WRI, 
And uh, this tier seems to be an interesting, you know, uh, tool to use because uh, there was the invest, the invest tool that we used to do some economics for, for restoration. Uh, but also there is the usual economic and financial analysis that you can do. So with this tier, what, what, what are those, what are differences? I mean, are you looking at all the other, econo the other tools like IRLs, the NPVs and all the rest and you're having a middle point? What, what, what is the difference? Just, just hope me. Thank you. Yeah, oh, maybe Christoph, you want to answer, but I think, I think that- it's not the tool. It's yeah, no, no, exactly. I think I would, I would think that the, the thing is, we, we, there was really this idea to start with actual data. Some of that is coming from projects that have already taken place, uh, what I think Valentina showed. And, 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 and. But, but the idea is to have a framework that is able to, to uh, pile up and stock and compile data from new projects being currently implemented and developed. And then yes, there, there can be linkages with other tools such as Rome that, that we, to, to enrich the layer on, on costs and benefits. Uh, of course, the, the, I think that the typologies of our interventions are quite similar. So that there shouldn't be any major difficulty to, to have the, the tier layer, in fact, be, be compatible with other analyses to look at where to prioritize interventions. Uh, but, 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 but the caveat is that since this database is in construction, it needs to be mature enough and well filled up enough to be credible and, and, to, be, and to be, so it, it's, yeah. So it's a little bit of a, of a snowball effect that we really want to create and use maybe the decade, uh, not maybe, use the decade to, to, to create that, that effect that will then make it a reference. Uh, yes. Yes, yes the other question. Sorry. I'm Dr. Fizul Bari from FAO Pakistan. Uh, a very interesting idea because previously you were struggling for the valuation of forest services, ecosystem services. And uh, of course, this was also very difficult how to arrive at that. And now with this uh, tool or this initiative, it would really help not only how the restore forest contribute, but also putting proper value to the existing forest, which are there. So thanks a lot, and it's a very good initiative. My one question is, when we use the word uh, project, uh, this may be a little bit uh, confining, but of course project is always there. It is easy to collect data. It is identifiable, input, output, very clear. But there are other initiatives which the government or the department take on their own. They don't call it a project. For example, if they have a forest which is degraded and uh, they put some rules regulation and the people abide by that, it doesn't cost much money, but it restore forest. So how your this methodology will capture that? Otherwise we will be getting a, a half picture what is happening. Uh, so that is very important to be really seen that how the third point, which is suggestion, how you will create, because this is not only globally important, but it is also very important for national level, mm -hmm. uh, how you will sensitize uh, different countries so that they can also value it and they can start on their own. These are my three questions. Thank you, sir. And these are excellent questions and very, I mean, they're, they're a bit at the heart of, of, of what we need to do next. I think my, my view and Christoph, correct uh, me, is it's, we, maybe the, the word project is your right, overused programs or, 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 or bigger plans or, or, or initiatives or, I mean, it's, it's covering all of that. As soon as there is one intervention or a set of intervention that, that are inscribed that enables to collect the kind of data. So yes, the perimeter is, 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 is that, but it is intervention on the ground doing uh, actual um, physical uh, activity. It's, it's not necessarily policy level or enabling environment that, that perhaps, but, but it goes beyond than just projects. There are programs, initiatives and so on. So fully, fully agree. Um, and, 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 and then, uh, Similarly to the national level questions, I think that is something that 
probably FAO will have to look at when it is mature enough. I know it's also a sensitive issue to deal with also the national governments on how this kind of database can then be used to produce national average or national data. So I think this is one of the items that will need to be discussed. I don't know, Christophe, where is the place in FAO when, the, when this can be discussed, but I guess since there was really this idea that this database is housed in FAO, um, that, that will be a question. Uh, yes, and then there are many other <laughs> hands. I, I mean, the organizers uh, hand to know when we need to close. I guess uh, they're not closing the co right now. So Vincent, sorry. Yeah. Can I intervene a second? Vincent? Yes, yes. We also have yes. some questions Fabio. from our participants oh, online. So bear in mind. Okay. Over. Okay. Okay. So let's let's give the room to the floor. The floor to the room. And yeah. So I very briefly. I um, I just want to thank everyone for developing a series of tools that we can use. I am I'm an agroeconomist. I am. I am, my name is Beatrice Dakuogri. And I work for the CSR Forestry Research Institute in Ghana. And uh, we often have difficulty when it comes to, let me call it a, a, a total, uh, doing a total uh, economics for restoration for whatever projects. But um, I, I think that um, most of you, we just want to do the financial analysis because we know that we can dodge the, 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 the headaches of wanting to estimate I identify the right indicators to be able to maybe do the total cost, so the total benefits for, let's say, biodiversity, including biodiversity, the social, as well as the, 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 the potential negatives that can occur with the implementation of a project. So coming from the research background, I'm happy that we still have another tool that we can use. And what I'm, I'm, I'm pleading is that I, am, I, I got an opportunity to, to participate in the exact use of the exact uh, well, for a very short period, and uh, still I'm trying to struggle with it. Uh, for some of these tools, whether if was able to organize a training session for, hmm. we are, I don't know how you're going to do it to be able to recruit the potential users. So, so we can also have a hand on and be able to use it properly. And I'm also wondering, uh, for instance, uh, as a researcher, I've dealt with a series of projects, like um, we have some projects that are uh, more of experimental, we want to experiment to see if we can use appropriate species to restore potential uh, land in a certain uh, uh, landscape that has peculiar. So um, uh, that is a different thing, uh, it's an experiment. Um, somebody might have invested money for doing that. Uh, so it's pure R. Sometimes we want to do R for D mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes we do only D. You know, because mm -hmm. of the experience, we get a project and we then we just go into a landscape. So yes. can, no, no, can we use the tool mm -hmm. for these scenarios? All these scenarios. I, I think you 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 spot on in this R for D or R. We, we in fact and and again tomorrow when we're going to to try to well we're going to launch this new uh, research for development partnership. In fact, we call it now research in development because what we need to do now is research in implementation. I think restoration is. The, the, the example where the, we are still, compared to the, the magnitude of the objective in a relatively data scarce environment in some of the dimensions, not all, but, but this has been identified as some of a weak point, which could lead to problems, as I think, if you over or under estimate the cost, then, then, you, then, then you, have, you, have, you have issues, as Alexandre mentioned at the very beginning. Um, so I think this is where the research community and, and the research community needs protocols. I don't think we, we need we need one, we need typologies, we need ways to construct methodologies to collect data. And that is one of the, the issues that this tool needs to, um, in fact, help construct. This is why, in fact, the tool, the partnership around the tool is already binding research organizations, international organizations, civil societies um, that have projects and so on. That's, that, that was the idea to make it something that is co-constructed and not having 10 different university inventing another way to make an, e an economic computation with another set of uh, you know, categories and so on. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, I know there are questions in the, in the Zoom room, Fabio, so maybe we have time to pick up. Yes, 
uh, also because our friends on Zoom, I assume they might have some other things uh, piling up in their agenda. So let me put them up. Okay, so these are the ones we found, we, we gathered. There's six questions and you can- Okay, we're, okay that's, that's good. We're not necessarily going to answer them all tonight, but, but maybe Christophe can have a look and pick one that he would like to, to, to see. Um, uh, I think there is one that is that is that is interesting is about uh, this idea of of maybe it's in the number three but Christophe, do you want to pick one questions or no? Minimum area, I guess that has been an, that's, I'm not sure the answer has been given to that. We can give, okay, or we can give very short answers to all of them. Uh, then raise your hand, the persons who have the answer in the room or on Zoom, but uh, Valentina and Fred, I'm not sure they are there. Live. No, Fre oh, Fred, Fred had is, to leave. Fred is live. Okay. No, Fred had to leave, I'm sorry. Oh, he had to leave. Yes. Okay, I can answer to the question. Okay, that's an important one. Where can we get the tool? Hello. As said in the video, uh, presented by uh, Valentina. Uh, if you are going on the tier web page of, of the Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism website, maybe uh, Benjamin, you can share the link. I don't know, or mm -hmm. in the chat, it's not easy because we are not connected ourselves. But we have a, a, a web page, uh, a website, the Forest Landscape Restoration Mechanism website or uh, on the FO website. There is uh, our there is a, a, a rubric with all our activities at national, yeah, global, sure regional yeah. level. If you go to global, you have the tier web page. On the tier web page, you have uh, the the framework uh, for collection of good practices that is available. Yeah, exactly. On the, in the blue blue part on the right side, tier template for data collection on cost and benefits. Sorry, my view is not very good on the blue, but I cannot read it actually the, the title of the framework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you click on this, you have automatically the Excel file uh, downloaded. So you can use uh, the, the framework. Okay, but that's the Excel file for inputting data then i'm going to challenge you a little bit can i access the data that others have inputted or that fao has inputted from the project we have had some statistics not, not yet because not yet. and we, we need to to work on this exactly uh, in the so i think that's but one of the what is available is the framework uh we don't have yet the, the database online okay so but that we, that is part of the next now, step as we are collecting more and more data to be um uh uh, yeah, to, to, to use the fact that we are giving access to information uh, as an incentive, uh, we should think very quickly how to uh, put online those informations and to give the opportunity to the data promo, uh, uh, provider to have access as well to, to, to information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that's answers the question number one. So Fabio, if you put the other questions, maybe we can to give a quick answer to to all of them is it necessary to have a control area that does not have restoration with condition comparable uh, or data that can be simply recorded for a project without a control so it's basically the issue of of baselines um and and control and yeah and, and and control you you want to answer alexandre or yeah you you can quickly it's a it's a very important question indeed uh, which also links to the baseline in terms of degraded areas and no. nature of intervention. Yeah. No. Uh, they, so the intention of, of the project is really to take the data from the ongoing project so that it's simple and, and, and not costly. Because if you have to, in, to find the exact control area with the same ecosystem, but not degraded, so to, to compare, 
it would in itself be a research question in many cases. So what we, what we do is we have the baseline, we collect the data, and then we see how it evolves and it answers the, the question uh, that we had in the beginning on how we follow it in the time. It is followed in the time uh, and which avoids having the, yeah, the area itself, it is, is its own control. Mm -hmm. Over. Yeah. Yes, the area itself before the intervention is the control. Noting that uh, there is, correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, there, there is the, in the database the possibility to record uh, opportunity costs or, or, yeah. or, 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 or benefits, of course, so that we, 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 we can record some of the, the baseline, we say what would have happened otherwise. Uh, in as an element of the data collection. But you don't need to have a control. The important point, I think the important take home, you don't need to have a control to make it work. It is usable on a new project as soon as you have sufficient elements on the context, the nature of the intervention and so on. And in, in, a, in a certain way, uh, when the database will be populated, we're also enabled to build some baseline information because the degree of degradation is not always the same in all the projects. So some projects will take place on different stage of, of restoration of degradation and we'll enable to construct some form of, of benchmarking for, for, restor for yeah, uh, going over a restoration baseline. I don't know if that's clear enough, but <laughs> that could be one. Maybe, yeah. maybe just tentative, very quick answer to all the questions that can then be yes. complemented. Uh, so that no, there is no minimum area or landscape site for a project to participate. As, as we said, the, the, it, it's rather the other way wrong, uh, the other way, yeah. Uh, we want to record the information for homogeneous zones where you have the same condition, the same baseline and the same intervention. So that it's it constitute, this is what we call an intervention unit. So an intervention unit can be quite small, depending on the cases. And, and, and you can have very small areas that are so important, wetlands, for instance, or peatlands. Or, um, how easy it is to implement that cost analysis purposes in ongoing refer same then for the rest. And I would say to a certain extent, reforestation projects may be quite of simple in terms of cost analysis. So I think all the categories that they are uh, in the current templates um, make it quite easy. And, and you know, even if c 4 craft is interested in plenty of other topics, so we still have a strong interest in forest. Um, and uh, then the, the the last question is a very interesting one, in fact, because we had very long discussion about it. Uh, who should use it? And the idea we had is that it is the project manager because first he's used to do that. And also because it provides a kind of level of quality control on the baseline, the data that's collected from farming. It's a way to, to have a kind of collective responsibility from the organization implementing a project to mm. guarantee the quality of the data. However, and we had long discussion, there are plenty of farmers that are interested in the information and that would be happy to provide that information. So I think that it, it's still a question of how we can facilitate the task for a farmer to so to use it, that's one thing, but to provide information is another one, but still having a kind of two levels of, of checking the quality of the information. Mm. So it's also part of the construction of the final database to have somewhere, somebody that said, mm, this cannot do, or there is something fishy behind. Because if you want to use that data for your own purposes, it, you want to be sure that it's good data. Yeah, mm -hmm. over. There, there is conversely also the idea that um, a little bit of an, edu not an educational tool, but uh, sometimes cost 
cost benefit or just cost analysis is made by just going too quick or too fast on some very important categories of cost that are bo borne by farmers. Say, oh, it's not a project cost. It's going to, but in a way, uh, you, you put an exclosure, <laughs> there is going to be some cost for some farmer there. So the database also can be an object to organize a discussion between the project implementers and the farmers in the community to say, okay, hey, have you recorded these costs? Uh, they're real. Uh, and, and, th and therefore, there is also a question which we have discussed with our colleagues on how we could use also the tool in a more refined way to make a category, you can have an overall cost benefit analysis, but then when you look at categories of actors, then some lose and some win. Overall, it may be a win-win, but when you look at finer, so that, that is something we would like the tool also to be useful for, also to improve project design or just, or, or just the collection of data in the first place. Yes. So I don't know, I think we, we've done a good job in, in answering, I think question three was answered as a kind of a former discussion about the national level. Um, um, but yes, uh, any other remark or, I don't know if someone was to, to conclude because I was just to facilitate discussion. Okay, no, if we still have time. Uh, okay. Yes. Hi, I am Rajra Maria. I am from the Nepal. I'm working for the Ministry of Forest and Environment as a remote sensing officer. Uh, today we have a one session. We developed the potential restoration area using the CEPAL platform uh, from the CIPLAN. Yeah. Uh, we use the global global socioeconomic layer. It is really helpful to uh, if we can develop some things for my country specific uh, specific socioeconomic layer using these tools so i just uh, i'm very interested to start uh, this within a, uh, in in my country thank you thank you and i think that brings to really a brilliant intervention because it brings to one of the ways by which i think putting FAO into uh, as the international organization into putting these two the knowledge of these two um, uh, into awareness of countries so that basically also they could also be involved and 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 and, and use it you know that that's yes how, how to do that maybe we need to discuss that with our colleagues from FAO but that's that's an excellent idea at this time we have kept this we have not, it's, it's in fact one of the first time we're making an intervention in a Congress co-organized with FAO. Uh, maybe the COFO could also be a place to, to deal with these issues. Alizia, yeah. Alizia. Yeah, oh, maybe the big microphone, either here or in front yeah, or... The rest or... of the world <laughs> Yeah, one was really to thank you for this uh, initiative. I think it's uh, something that we can all see the value. And uh, what is lingering on my mind is, uh, okay, my name is Nelly from Uganda. Sorry about that. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. So I just wanted to ask about the data validity because mm. you talked about ongoing projects, but we also have quite some wealth of information from projects that have been recently concluded. So how recent? is you know data that you would consider you know uh, good enough for this uh, framework and then the other one is to do with the uh, uh, the framework it itself you said it is something still under construction but hopefully it will be concluded soon mm. so we also know that restoration does take long we have all appreciated mm. that and for costs probably we can be somehow exact but mm. when it comes to benefits maybe it's mm. rather projections. Yes. So is there going to be like a round of, you know, when we can again do a bit of cleanup because it is not just about feeding any information anyway, it has to be co information that, you know, communicates and that has a meaning. Thanks a lot. Mm. Tu, tu veux répondre sur les, yeah, maybe Alexandre can reply on the issue of, of quality of data, which is quite crucial. The, the question of the ongoing project, the reason why we focused on a current project is that what has been shown in scientific papers is that to go 
in many cases, the data was not collected in the past. So if you don't have it, you cannot invent it. And if you want to reconstruct it in the past, when it was not collected, it is extremely expensive. This is why we said, you know, the simpler is just to say, you are starting your project. Now, every year you collect this and that. But it is also true, and this is what Valentina has presented, that there are old projects or ongoing projects that have some data. And so, fine, if it's, if it's good enough, I mean, that there are the elements in it, yes, it can be used. And, and, and also we realized with this piloting on old projects that in some cases, even if you have holes on your, in your data, it's still interesting because sometimes you can fill the gaps with some other projects in a comparable situation. So I think it's really, and the second question was? What about the quality of data? Well, on, on the, question, the question of, of cleaning and the question of quality, this is why I was mentioning this question about who is collecting the data. And, and so at, at some stage when you create the database, you, you, you have to check the quality of or everything that you enter in it, and 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 also think about the pol the idea of sometimes cleaning a bit, and also sometimes making an inventory and and thinking, oh, drylands are not there. We need something on drylands, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, over. Uh, but but in, in a way, I think in a way, uh, but maybe we were too over ambitious. But when we had with all our partners, institution. The idea of creating that was also a problem of quality of data because basically it was a bit of a problem to have very sometimes a bit dubious numbers in some publications um, dubious or numbers that we couldn't trust enough to say this is really exact so in fact this database for, we're going to collect raw data we're not going to say it's right or wrong but with time if there will be sufficient data points then we will be able to look at is that meaningful in, on the scientific term, making an experiment? Anyway, that, that's, that's, that's so in a way, this tool should not be questioned as, okay, what is the input, the quality of the input? We will go that, we will go at the second stage looking at, okay, what is the, what does that mean for general data quality assembly? I think, I think we're, we are concluding, we, no? To, 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 to peux conclure, peut-être the... tu veux prendre le microphone ici? Ou... Tu sais, you're the boss. We saw you in the, we saw you in the, how many people in that room? 18? 10,000? Yeah, thank you. Now, just to say that maybe based on the discussion today and based on the strong interest of most uh, uh, colleagues coming from countries, uh, it seems that we have maybe missed an opportunity during the last years and uh, we should correct that to have more discussion with countries, project coordinators at country level. Um, because the tool seems useful. You, are, you, are, you have interest to, to use it, to test it um, as maybe a solution for some uh, uh, project you are implementing. Or, and, uh, and at this stage, we stay maybe a bit too much in a scientific or a group of a community uh, at global level, and we were not enough uh, in contact with uh, with the country level. And uh, yes, I agree that the fact that we have a COFO in October 2022 20, uh, uh, with a lot of country, uh, maybe we could have a, try to have a, an event more focused on uh, how to promote the use of the framework at country level. Um, and we need probably to, to work on this. This is the spirit of what we want to do as well in the context of the impact program follower in the, on the GF7. We have already a small, yeah, small amount of money to provide on demand for the national projects, the national teams uh, that want to monitor in detail the cost and the benefits uh, of the restoration component, we will be able to provide to the national team a backstopping support. 
to help them to understand the framework, to help them to uh, uh, fill the, the, the tables, uh, to be sure that they are understanding well uh, how to fill it, and to be sure that the quality of the data is at the standard that we are expecting. And um, yeah, clearly, this is a, the momentum now to, to, to connect uh, ourselves uh, with the country level uh, at, the, at the broader scale that we, we did during the pilot phase. We contacted few countries for a pilot phase, five, six countries, but now we need to, to systematically maybe be more active with you. Uh, I think the event was very interesting in terms of feedback. So uh, I hope that the people in, uh, in, uh, in Washington or uh, in Rome uh, appreciated the, the timing. It was not too early for them. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your contribution. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of other side events on FLR strategy, the restoration initiative, uh, uh, genetic resources for uh, forest landscape restoration. There is an event with the GPFLR tom tomorrow, the global partnership on FLR. We have one on carbon and, and FLR, climate change and FLR on Friday. Uh, so don't hesitate to join those events virtually for the people outside uh, of Seoul and uh, physically for the one in the meeting room. Thank you and have a good night.